G'day viewers. In this segment I'll introduce the topic of network security. So network security is an interesting topic for us because it really spans all of the layers. And the reason for that is that each layer can introduce its own risks in terms of security. So as we look at the different uh, material in this topic, we're going to cover all of the different layers. Our focus as we work through all of the material in this unit is really about different kinds of security designs that protect against different kinds of threats. Often the mechanisms we look at in the designs will build on cryptography. It's a very powerful, um, very powerful set of techniques which can be used to provide different kinds of security properties. So I'll tell you a little bit about cryptography, but really our focus is building on it. And I also want to stress this, that what I'm providing you with is just a brief overview of the topic. And we're doing that because security is an important topic these days in networks, but it's usually handled as part of other courses. You can take whole courses on security. So we can really cover relatively little in the time we have available. I'm going to go through some of the material fairly quickly, and it's really to raise your sense of awareness on the topics and the issues and give you a sense of it so that you can follow up and take a complete course if you're interested. Okay, so the first uh, concept that we'll come up with in security is that of a security threat. Now, this is really a very important part of understanding security. And the reason is this, that we all talk about security. Have you read the papers lately? There's bound to be something about security. But security is really a little bit like performance in that it means many different things to many different people. There's many different kinds of security. So if we want to have any kind of sensible discussion about security and different protocols and so forth, we need to define carefully the kinds of properties we want in terms of security. And this is often given as what's called a threat model. We state either the properties we want or the different kind of uh, threats that, uh, that might cause those properties to fail. So th that is, it says here we're going to list the dangers and the attacker's abilities in terms of breaking into, breaking the security of the system. And this is necessary because without an understanding of the dangers we're trying to protect against and the attacker's abilities in terms of getting through them, we really can't make any kind of sensible assessment of the risk uh, that's involved in the system. Just to give you an example, so here, uh, here are some example threats in this table. And really one reason I, I give you this table too is to uh, give you the sense that security is not all about encrypting messages so no one can read them. That's the first thing we think of when we say security. That's really this threat here. The threat is given over here in this column. The threat is that someone else will read the contents of your messages. Really the attacker here is an eavesdropper. So the first threat that's listed here in this model is that an eavesdropper will be able to read the contents of our messages. And the ability they have to do that is is simply to intercept messages. Exactly how they do this we don't know, but we assume that they have this ability. So they're out there somehow able to tap into the network, really just to listen to what's going on. This is what we would often think of as classic security in protecting the system. But there's actually much more. You might think of, for instance, um, intruders who are inside your system because they're at a compromised host and the threat is really the ability to tamper with the contents of messages that are sent from your machine. Um, there could be other threats too that we're not going to cover because we're focused on network security like theft of information from your machine. Here's yet a, a different kind of threat. Um, and the threat here is not so much reading the contents of a message but tricking someone into giving you information when they really wouldn't have given it if they'd known what was going on. So the attacker here is an impersonator and uh, an ability that's used a lot is something called social engineering. You might call someone up and claim to be someone else and uh, trick them into revealing information. The same sort of thing can go on in the network. It's all of these phishing attacks and something else. And here's yet another threat just to uh, provide something that's really very different than encrypting messages. The threat here is one of availability. The threat is about disrupting the network services. Who might do that? Well, an extortionist, someone who had a botnet or many, many, many remote machines which could somehow jam up the network by sending a lot of traffic, for instance. This is also a kind of security. It's just it's a very different threat than encrypting messages for secrecy. 
And as we, uh, so now we have a bit of an understanding of the different threats and there are different kinds of security. As we assess security, we'll often take a risk management point of view. And this is because security is really uh, a negative goal that makes it hard. You're trying to stop something happening. So you're trying to ensure positive properties by making sure that uh, you don't let anything bad happen. Well, how are you going to uh, make sure that's the case? The difficulty here is that security, a system, is only as secure for whatever property you care about as the weakest link in the chain. So if we're trying to understand the security of a system, often we might take a risk management point of view and look at all of the different risks which will undermine the security of the system and see how big they all are. Um, and the reason for saying this, of course, is that we're going to use cryptography. And if the designs are well put together, if, if the primitives are very strong, you won't be able to break the cryptography itself. However, the system may not be secure. Uh, it could well be that there is a design flaw not in the pieces themselves, but the way they're put together. This is quite common, the way they're used. Or there could uh, simply be a bug in the code. The design was fabulous, but someone made a mistake implementing it. Whoops. Or actually, more often than not, the weak link in the chain is something else. It's something in here, and guess what? It's you and I. Uh, for instance, uh, people need to choose passwords to use all of these systems. If you choose very weak passwords or share passwords, you might compromise the security of the system no matter how good the crypto is. So people are often viewed as the weakest link in security schemes. So just as an example of uh, risk management and uh, how everything comes to play, let's just think for a moment about 802.11. This is the kind of network that we would want to be secure against eavesdropping. So 802.11 security. Actually, early on, you probably heard that there were big problems here. Early on, there was this scheme called WEP. It stood for Wide Equivalent Privacy. It, it used cryptography. However, it turned out that the cryptography was really flawed in many different ways. People discovered this over time and found that these compromises weren't theoretical. They were very practical. Now you can download software packages, which if a network is using web, can just intercept messages as an eavesdropper and crack the security of the scheme, get the network password and be able to read everything within a few minutes. So really, there, this is not a strong defense against security. This is well known and today the standard is not to use web, but there's a new scheme. We'll look at this eventually. This is WPA2 or 802.11i. This is a much better cryptographic design, and as far as we know, it's computationally infeasible to break this. Computers would just have to compute for so long to read messages that it's not going to happen. So we've taken a major step up here. My question for you is, does this mean that 802.11 is secure? Against eavesdropping, I have to say what the threat is, so against someone eavesdropping and listening into your messages. Is it secure against that? Well, uh, not necessarily. And the reason is that there are many possible threats. In fact, I've listed some here in, the, in this table here. And you can see that the one we've been talking about with WEP and WPA2 is uh, intercepting messages from the outside and breaking the encryption. We shifted that from very easy to very difficult by moving from WEP to WPA2. However, there are many other ways that someone might successfully be able to eavesdrop on your messages. They might be able to guess your Wi-Fi password. Uh, this is often possible. It shouldn't be if you've chosen a good password for your wireless network. But there are many networks out there that might still be running with the default network. You know, many networks uh, you can see already have Linksys or something as a name. So often what was shipped with the system hasn't been changed. Or your choice of password might be fairly obvious. Um, because it's related to, uh, you know, uh, your birthday or something like that, or other passwords you've used. So often it will be possible to compromise the system here. Even if you can't do that, it might be possible, and this requires more access, to get the password from a computer. Maybe when you're not at home, you have your laptop around work or somewhere, and someone is able to look at your uh, laptop and get passwords off them, or your mobile phone, and so forth. There are lots of passwords on all of these devices. This might be possible. It seems a little harder. But your home network security could be broken, so people could eavesdrop into it by people outside your house gaining access to the password where it exists in many other places. 
Failing all of this, you could physically break into the home where you have physical access to the device, in which case you'd be able to find out what's going on. This seems like much more effort. I've listed this as difficult. It seems very unlikely compared to the others. What's the point of all of this exercise? The point is that there are many possible threats which would lead to the same outcome of people being able to read your messages. So if we want to understand if a system is secure, we really need to consider the range of threats here because the weakest one will be the, the issue. We've strengthened with WEP, we've moved from WEP to WPA2 and we've addressed this threat much more effectively. But there are other threats. So in fact, 802.11 is not secure in any absolute sense. Rather, it's more secure with WPA2 than WEP. So if you care about security, you should get used to thinking in terms of this way because things like physical access matter as much as the security protocols sometimes. Okay, so let's move on. I've completed most of an introduction. As we look at security designs, we'll actually talk about, uh, well, well, we won't so much go over the details, but we'll see cryptographic schemes in use. So um, cryptographic schemes are part of cryptology. Cryptology has a very rich history. You know, these are all of the classic stories you'd read about spies in the military sending secret messages from one to the other in code. This is great stuff. Um, cryptology or cryptography comes from the Greek for a hidden writing. So there are really two parts to it. The cryptography part is the encryption of information, coding information. You know, so you can send spy messages with no one being able to read them. The flip side of this is cryptanalysis. This is really breaking the code. So obtaining encoded information and possibly some unencoded information that goes with it and really working out how the scheme works so that you can break it. And someone like that eavesdropper can successfully read messages. Now, um, for all of the modern codes we'll look at, look, we will look at, the emphasis is on designing codes which are uh, considered computationally infeasible to break. That is, it's not impossible to break them in theory, but you'd have to compute for so long it's just not possible. So the emphasis is on coming up with designs which are clever in this way, rather than, for instance, uh, obscuring the algorithm for encoding information, writing it down and just letting no one find it and assuming if they can't find it, they won't be able to decode it. Or using a key that's, for instance, the uh, time of day and um, just not telling anyone that because if they knew that they'd be able to break the scheme. That is called security by obscurity and our focus is elsewhere for all of these other schemes. So we'll see some of the designs in uh, the following videos and another point I would like you to take away is that while we're going to use encryption for uh, concealing information from eavesdroppers, encryption is actually much more useful and in most of the protocols we look at we'll be doing more than concealing information from eavesdroppers. For instance, and this is pretty cool, you can use encryption to uh, prove that a message came from a real sender, the sender you thought it did, uh, to prove that uh, the remote party you're interacting with is who, you, who they say they are, or to prove that a message that came over the network not only hasn't been read by an eavesdropper, but hasn't been altered while it's in transit. These are all very useful properties, of course, and we'll want them in many of the schemes we put together. I also want to make the point that designing cryptographic schemes, good ones, which are secure in terms of the properties we want, is very difficult. I don't think many of you would try and uh, expect that you could go and design your own cryptographic scheme and put it to use and it would survive uh, attacks. None of us are likely to do that. So, you're not, so rather, we're likely to use approved designs. And this is what you should do in any system. But it's also important to use them in an approved way. Many security uh, compromises are the result of using sound techniques and primitives, uh, cryptographic primitives, but in an unusual way, a way which wasn't approved, which often led to some subtle flaw which let someone completely defeat the system. So it's important not only to use approved designs, but to use them in the right way. Oh, okay, and one more point to make, just as our lead into security. And that's to give you a sense of uh, the internet and where security fits in. Actually, the internet's a little uh, different in terms of security. Most of the key protocols, all of the TCP, IP, DNS, all of the protocols we know and love, they were developed um, well, well before security problems became a pressing issue. 
When they were developed and deployed and first used, the internet was a, a smaller and more trusted world. Uh, initially it was you know, almost a bunch of academics talking to one another, you could think, is a reasonable proxy for it. In this world it was smaller and more trusted, more friendly, so security was simply a less pressing issue and many of the protocols lacked uh, any kind of reasonable security protection. The world has changed today and now we know that we need strong security in the internet. There are a lot of nasty people out there that if you use the internet you would want to defend yourself against. And um, it's a big internet. We have our clients. You will often use your host to talk to unverified servers out there who you don't really know who they are. Uh, you just hope they're not going to do anything nasty. Servers are often talking to clients that they've never met before, so these clients are anonymous in some sense. We just hope everything's good. And to deal with all of the various problems that would arise, security has been retrofitted into all of these protocols. They're much stronger than they used to be, but retrofitting security is not ideal from a security point uh, at all. It's much better to design security as part and parcel of the scheme. Just as an example, uh, we often want compatibility too. So many protocols will downgrade to the earlier version. Well, just think of that as uh, downgrading to the insecure version. If you're a, an attacker and you could either use the secure version of the protocol or the insecure version of the protocol, which version, version do you think you would try and talk to a server with? Well, the insecure version, of course. So there's a bit of a tension there with retrofitting protocols. Security really needs to be built in from the start. Okay, so that's our introduction. So far we've talked about uh, some of the, the threat models, the concept of threat models. Um, next we're going to cover our introduction to crypto and talk about how you can provide uh, confidentiality and authentication of messages. And um, after that we're going to go through various material. You'll see how crypto is applied in different ways, at different layers. So you're securing 8211 through securing the web for instance as well as the DNS and new constructs like virtual private networks. And we'll also see some security problems that have little to do with crypto. Firewalls and distributed denial of service attacks are really more about preserving connectivity properties. And uh, that's why they're not handled so much with um, encryption, but nonetheless they're important security properties in the internet today. Great, so let's get on with it.